everybody and welcome and thank you all for joining our session on Big Data to Scale a Reality Check. My name is Maria Camila Gomez and I am the Data Driven Agronomy Community of Practice Administrator. I will be your technical moderator for this session. Um, so I'll pass on now to Daniel. So hi everyone and welcome to this session on scaling. I am Daniel Jimenez, the leader of the Community of Practice on Data Driven Agronomy. Just to remind you to all of you that scaling was chosen as the topic of this year as the, during the previous big data convention in India. Uh, alongside the participants, we reached a consensus that scaling is a major bottleneck to digital extension. And to be honest, I, I'm very happy we did, not only because the engagement it has created along the different webinars we organized, but also because as someone working on research for development in agronomy, I've learned a lot from Leonard and the Agriculture and Rural Development Working Group and the different speakers. I learned a lot, for example, about how can we go beyond a theory of change and we can together identify how our projects can be sustainable. But more important, importantly, how, how can we get uh, the, how our projects can get the scale that we intended. So that's all that I wanted to say to introduce the, the topic. So let's get started and I'll hand over to Lena now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. So my name is Leonard Wokering. I'm working in Mexico for the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center as a scaling catalyst. So with scaling in my, in my job description even. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Agricultural and Rural uh, Development Working Group of the International Community of Practice on, on Scaling. And together with the Big Data Platform and, and this group, we did a very nice uh, series of, of, of webinars on, on scaling, and I'm happy to, to help out with this one. Uh, but first, I would like to say a few words on the scaling lens that we want to apply today. So scaling is only present. Everybody talks about it. It's uh, everybody wants it. Everybody does it. Uh, and it's also logical. We are in reaching the sustainable development goals. We have a long way to go, and there's not much that needs to be done fast. So everybody says, okay, let's, let's scale, no? However, on the other hand, we also learned that a successful project is no guarantee for a success at scale. As a matter of fact, about 95% of the projects and pilots that we do never make it to the intended scale that we had envisioned, right? Nevertheless, we keep investing in those projects. We keep investing in, in sending external experts to some other country to tell them, okay, increase the adoption of this innovation up to the 31st of December 2022, please, right? However, change is gonna come. There's a vibrant community of international and national donors, researchers, development uh, actors that are challenging this modus operandi, the way that we do our development projects and the way we approach uh, research for development. Uh, so we are trying to develop tools and approaches to think beyond the boundaries of our project, of what we are trying to do in terms of place, but also in terms of time. Try to avoid project dependencies and operate as a larger movement to, to change. And today I'm really happy uh, that we can hear about this interface between big data and scaling. First, on how big data can be used to reach many people, not project beneficiaries, but normal, real people, and how to incentivize actors in the middle of the value chain to support scaling, because they find it makes sense to them, not because they are benefiting from a particular project or something. Right? Then, we have an, um, then we have another, uh, and in my mind, maybe the biggest bottleneck in moving the needle on scaling, and that is that it's today so much easier to do a project where you get rewarded, where you get more funding, where you get even a new project if you count X farmers on the, uh, count X farmers adopting or maybe testing uh, your innovation on the 31st of December, 2022. The change process required for scaling go much deeper into the enabling environment, but we are not able to provide this credible evidence on behaviors that are changing the change in policies, the changes in the landscape, which are actually the big indicators that change is going to sustain uh, with them and, and for them, right? And Marshall is going to talk a little bit about this. So I'm really happy and excited about this. But first, let me introduce the first speaker, 
His name is David uh, Guerena. I was happy enough to have him as my colleague uh, until last year here in Mexico. He's a soil scientist from Cornell University, uh, but passionate about the link with digital agriculture. And we've had many uh, coffee breaks and, and lunches together talking about this passionately. So I'm really happy now that we can do this also in a more formal setting and, and battle this out between scaling and the, and, the, and the digital agriculture. The second speaker today is Marshall Burke. He's an associate professor in the Department of Earth System Science, deputy director at the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. His research focuses on social and economic impacts of environmental change and on measuring and understanding economic development in emerging markets. Suits well, right? Some will recognize his voice because he was recently on a free economics episode, which I uh, happened to hear and thought, ah, Marshall, we should talk to him. So I'm happy that they're there. And uh, David, take it away. Thanks, Lynn. Quick correction is uh, I work for the big data platform at the CGIR. Um, how is that of, out of SEAT, Alliance for Biodiversity? I was with Cornell, but not anymore. So thanks, Leonard. Uh, my perspective will be from the ground. How do we then look at scaling field programs? So with that, let me switch to my screen share. Okay, so, um, we have as a as a organization or as a community practice in research for development, agriculture development. We're coming back with a, a I think, wonderful history of, of taking projects and making them to scale um, in agriculture. And I, the probably the most famous is Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution. Within a, a period of, of 10 years or so, these, this, he set really the, the what's possible for scaling really important agricultural programs across the developing world. But the 1950s and 60s, and I think one of the issues for reaching scale now with Ag Research for Development is that the tools that were developed during Norman Borlaug's time haven't really been ad adopted and really been adapted to the modern co context uh, that we live in today. So for instance, how can we, uh, as a community of ag research, both tackle the issues of scale across geographies, but also cultural changes, technology changes, societal changes, and political environments? So how can we take what, what we do from a research perspective and scale it across these areas, but at the same time providing really targeted goods at the local level and the village level? And I think this is where some of the issues with uh, with that our past legacy using Norman Borlaug as an example have, have kind of been a, a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, we're, we're uh, example, but on the other hand, if we keep trying to replicate what's happened using the old tools, we're not gonna get to where we need to get to today. And I think one of the complexities that we face with is that there's immense uh, choices that exist for people all over the world. Whether it's fertilizer types, whether it's seed types, um, whether it's farming practices. And so how can we then look at providing choice and, and limited choice that people are now used to with uh, local relevance uh, at scale geographically and, and otherwise? And I think this is where machine learning and artificial intelligence has really you know, come to play a really important role. You know, these tools are, are fairly good at identifying and addressing issues of complexity at scale. But I think one of the issues that provide us um, impediments to scale is trying to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning as the end all and be all to achieve what we want to achieve. You know, in reality, these tools are not very intelligent or smart. And, and they're just a tool in the toolbox, just like the field techniques that Norman Borlaug developed are one tool in our toolbox. We need to really think about context. How can we put these tools to best use given the context of what we hope to achieve? So I'd like to walk you all through one example of, of really how do we do this from the beginning to the end, um, given a project um, in Nepal that I was involved with a few years ago. So the project is, is like many projects that we have in the Ag Research for Development community. It's a donor funded project. And, and typically as Leonard pointed out, there's very distinctive benchmark outputs that we have to achieve. If we don't achieve these, we don't get our money, we don't get funding for future projects. And how do we balance these with wanting the goal of scaling something that's actionable and, and reliable for people beyond the lifetime of the project. So some typical benchmark outputs would be yields. You know, we need to increase yields. We need to increase, to increase our access 
to a certain number of farmers that are reached given the lifetime of the project. We also need to ensure that new practices are implemented and adopted by farmers. At the same time, we have to think about ex expansive geographies, so executing these types of, of things across big scales um, in diverse ecologies and complex cropping systems. And while you know we might have two or three or four or five years of a project, in the life of a cropping cycle, these are very execute the project. So it's really quite challenging. And despite you know, a lot of financial resources that are going into it, in the grand scheme of, of development context of a scale, even large resources are really um, quite small compared to the, the challenge that we have to, to face. So the approach that we took was to, to try to structure and to, to derive sort of a, a strategy for how we wanted to approach and given the constraints that we have, we came up with a couple of key areas to identify. And I think this is really key to enable scale for projects to identify really not, not just the theory of, but how then do we action on this theory of change to achieve the goals. And in this case, we wanted to focus on areas with high farmer population densities, where actual people are, um, with high yield gaps. If we target places that really have a very small yield gap, then I think the chance of the benefit are, are really small. We also want to have a good response to our intervention, really match up, do with the needs that are, um, that are available to the farmers. And then uh, we want to have access to inputs. So if we don't provide access to some of the technologies that we're, that we're promoting, then I think that we're going to be uh, really shooting ourselves in the foot of achieving scale. And then finally, we want to think about pathways for knowledge dissemination. How can we then disseminate our knowledge that we're generating from our projects effectively and efficiently. So the approach that we had was leveraging artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning, looking at remote sensing. So we took satellite imagery and were able to, to quickly and effectively map croplands, roads, houses for the entire project region in a very short period of time. Uh, so as the previous slide sort of mentioned, one of the, the limiting factors that we have from existing technologies and existing methodologies is that they're really expensive to scale, right? Doing a, a, a really low number of, of surveys, of household surveys in the order of hundreds of households or a thousand households will be many tens of thousands of dollars. We're able to, to, to create using these tools um, information at national and landscape scales, given a really a small fraction of the per person uh, cost. This is really, I think, one of the ways we can use big data and, and machine learning to really help us to enable how we can scale programs. And then the second is how can we then identify, you know, crop yield gaps and, and where intervention should be. And in this case, we can leverage the same type of techniques, but with different objectives. In this case, using remote sensing and, and field level uh, crop surveys to predict what yields would be and what the yield gaps would be across large contexts that we now can overlay atop where the crop lines are and where people are. Um, and then we can look at uh, the bottom left, which is a uh, soil, soil map. We can start layering then on top of these things, some of the bio or biogeographical or economic or social uh, layers that we can stack on top of that. So we can really understand where we want to target some of our interventions. So here's where we can then look at some of the tools that were developed, um, field tools that were developed during the time of Norman Borlaug you know, these are still really powerful tools that can help us really derive what the causal relationships are between what we're seeing on the field and what some of our interventions would be. And now if you put these in context um, of sort of the spatial arrangement of, of socioeconomics, of biophysical constraints, then we can start to derive uh, what some of the interventions would be and what some of the outputs from the interventions would be. In this case, from this project, we're really able to understand and pick up sensitivities to fertilization, um, both nitrogen fertilization and how it's applied, and also zinc and micronutrient responses. And we're able to quantify the, the relative impact from per unit availability of any one of these fertilizers, and able to then take our information before and start predicting where some of these interventions should be on, on within the landscape to start to drive into the specific regional or village level or household level interventions. So we outlined this in, in some of uh, papers that will be coming out, some of this methodology. We hope to be able to share that with the community you know, as they become published. And one of the things that we saw deriving from this is not just ability to affect uh, changes at the crop level, 
but also looking at how do these things really start to affect the broader socioeconomic conditions. In this case, looking at zinc and how zinc uh, availability in soils affects it in plants and how that eventually affects uh, child stunting and, and mortality rates among uh, farming populations. So really quite, quite interesting uh, additive uh, changes that we're finding. So now we have these tools, right? We say, okay, we've, we've done our research, we've done some really good uh, design, and now we have a product that we want to scale. And I think this is a, a critical bottleneck that a lot of projects come up to. We have this great project, just scale publishers, and, and it should achieve the scale that we want. And we get frustrated that it doesn't. And I think we need to think about what, what's the bottleneck here that we're doing. And I think this is translational piece that's missing. How can we translate effectively the project outputs that we have into ways that, that users can, can take it to then use that into the value chain of what we're doing. And in this case, if we don't have, uh, of the fertilizers, if we don't have actual fertilizers on the market, then it's not gonna go anywhere. So we took our information and were able to work with government and private industry to develop the, the infrastructure around government policy and private sector involvement to be able to take a, an idea and a concept and roll that into quantitative and qualitative products. So fertilizer that's enriched the zinc and, and making that available across the country. And then on the knowledge perspective, okay, we have a product now. How can we change farmer behavior to adopt a product that hasn't been on the market yet? And this case, agricultural extension, traditional extension has been used to really effectively in the past um, to be able to do this. So we created a really nice uh, integrated uh, agricultural extension environment that integrated then uh, classroom with field practice uh, and was, it, was, uh, um, it was endorsed by the government and developed with the government. So it's a nice tool, but again, uh, can this really scale? And, and as we think about the costs, the cost of scaling of $100 per farmer, if we need to reach, at least for the project, hundreds of thousands or millions of farmers, we don't have the financial resources to do this. So we need to think about new technologies to leverage uh, what we have. So there's been a lot of talk and discussion recently and some really good papers that have been published about the use of digital technologies and tools to scale agricultural extension. But one of the limiting factors, I think, is our understanding of, of what these tools are. Um, these tools are not magic tools, right? I think a lot of the fallacy that we, that we say is that if we have an app or develop an app, then scale will come, but that's not true. And I think if we change our mindset from a magic wand to an instrument, that analogy I think is more practical to what we can do, right? An instrument, if you see a really good thing, it looks really behind the scenes developing their skill over many years and they're, only using their skills that they developed, but they're putting it in context of what's going on around them. So we need to put our, our technology in context of what's happening. We also need to think about all the, the development resources and the development time that's needed to create a product that's really useful. And there's been some literature that's showing different types of products, whether it's SMS, whether it's interactive voice response, whether it's going to be uh, phones, starting to come across in the literature about what some of the, the benefits and the, the drawbacks for these tools are and what context they're available. But I think there's just still an opportunity for research to fill in some of the gaps. Um, there's still a lot of holes in the literature that we have in our understanding about how these tools really, really fit into the system. So what we did in the context of Apollo again is we ran a randomized control trial um, by looking at how we can message some of the outputs from our project. So in our trial, we had face-to-face -face extension, we had SMS and IVR, we had radio, we had smartphones, and we ran this across you know, the entire environment that we were working in. And what we found was that the smartphone app and the face-to-face -face extension were the most significant uh, driver for change, for behavior change, um, but also for changing agronomic literacy. So that's really nice. Um, we can now scale a smartphone app at a much lower cost than we can face-to-face -face extension. <clears throat> But some of the context is also really important about how does this affect uh, amongst different socioeconomic status with the farmers. In this case, we found that the smartphone app and the ag extension were really working the same way, both on the higher end of, of incomes and lower end of incomes, but were found very different uh, context within gender. So women were, were not as responsive to some of the technology and they were more responsive to some of the traditional methods. So further understanding how these things can, can be used in the context, I think is still needed. And, and we have a lot of work to go still to be able to understand these contexts. 
And then finally, once we have all the information we need, I think some of the barriers to scale that we have is barriers that we introduce upon ourselves. Um, we have a tendency, I think, within the scientific research community to make access as limited as possible for some of the data and outputs that we have. And um, in, in historical terms, this would have been papers sitting on shelves, but I think in modern terms, you know, this is really what it looks like, right? Access to critical information is really restricted to sort of our, the people that we want to work with. And I think as a community, we need to embrace some of the, the changes coming from open access and open data, um, especially if we're looking at publicly funded research projects. And in this case, we need to be thinking about how can we create an environment where our data can be used and adapted by the, any user to the condition and the local context that they have to provide them with choice and the ability to adapt to their context. So one of the concrete outputs that we put from our, our Nepal program was creating a, a digital environment that allowed different users to adapt it to their certain contexts. So for instance, this NEFIA is the Nepal Fertilizer Association. What they want is they wanted maps and they wanted uh, CSV files. So we provided that to them. Uh, we worked with, which is a tech company that, com that uh, collaborated with uh, one of the main major mobile networks in, in Nepal and they were able to scale using CSV file, other digital tools uh, to millions of farmers across Nepal. And then we had uh, the rural users coming from GeoKrishi, uh, a local uh, agritech startup in Nepal, and they really wanted just access to APIs. And so we were able to provide them API access to all of our information. And I think by creating this open environment, uh, we're really enabling, the, uh, creating the enabling environment that we want uh, to take our, our interventions to scale. So I hope that was uh, instructive. Uh, I look forward to discussing and hearing from Marshall next. So thank you. Uh, pass it on to you, Marshall. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for having me at this great event. Um, and I really wanna pick up on a few uh, things that Lenard started with and that uh, David already very nicely covered here. So um, I wear two hats. One is as a researcher at Stanford University where we are trying to uh, use new technologies uh, particularly new information from a range of satellites that have been launched in the last few years, uh, and combine them with new insights from artificial intelligence to try to understand how we can use these new technologies and apply them to the sorts of questions uh, that, uh, that motivate this session. So as we think about scaling up agricultural interventions, um, how do we target them correctly? Can we use this new technology to help the targeting of these interventions? David just gave a nice example of, of how that can work. Uh, and then how can we do the hard work of actually understanding whether these interventions work? And as Lenard said, I think our goal in a lot of this is not just to understand how many farmers got a particular intervention, but whether uh, that intervention had an impact in the world. And, and that's the sort of evaluation we need to do. So we've been doing work at Stanford to try to understand whether we can use these new technologies to do these two tasks, the targeting task and the evaluation task at scale. Uh, and we're pretty convinced that we can, at least in some, some domains that I'll talk about. Um, and so we also have a startup called Atlas AI that was generously funded with some initial money from Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and, and really our goal there is to scale up uh, a lot of these technologies and make them useful uh, for folks in the CG and elsewhere who are trying to use these technologies, again, at scale to do things in the world. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our estimates there. Um, so again, I think in the impact assessment sphere, we want to think about uh, agricultural impact directly, productivity uh, being one of the main targets often, uh, but we also want to think about household livelihoods and, and really think about broader impact of these interventions. Uh, and this is a slide just to, to emphasize how poor our current measurement of these outcomes is at scale. So on the left is just a map of the nationally representative household surveys that we have um, available many of these are not even public. These are just surveys that we know have occurred uh, that measure key household livelihood indicators, again, in a nationally representative way. So these are the living standards measurement surveys. These are the DHS surveys. These are other surveys that NSOs do around the world. And, you know, in some countries, we get them annually or every other year if we're lucky. Um, and in many others, if we're lucky, we get one per decade. And again, these are sample surveys. So we might have 10,000 households per country and we get them very intermittently. So given the data environment right now, it's very hard to use the existing survey base to do any sort of either targeting or impact assessment. Um, so we're gonna need new approaches. On the right here shows 
uh, it converts uh, how often we do those surveys into revisit intervals, which is something we think about a lot when we use uh, satellite technology. How frequently do satellites come back and re-image the same place on the Earth? So we can calculate that for surveys, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about once every 1,000 years or worse, right? So these surveys are happening incredibly infrequently at sort of the household level. Uh, for satellites, it's much better. So you can see on the right here, the solid lines are the satellites, and a few satellites launched in the past years by the Europeans, by uh, the private sector, uh, have really changed the game in how frequently we image the Earth. So we get a cloud-free image of pretty much every corner of the Earth uh, once a week or once a day. Uh, depending on the resolution. So that's amazing. And we want to understand how can, again, how can this new insight from the sky be used to make progress on these questions we care about? Okay, and the last motivation on the data side is that existing data sources are not in obvious agreement. So here are two very independent data sources compared, measuring maize yields uh, in three important countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, Malawi, Nigeria. This is comparing at the district level official government data with data from the LSMS, the Living Standards Measurement Surveys. As you can see, there's both bias and a lot of noise in these measurements. In some countries, Nigeria being an example from the data here, uh, the measures aren't even correlated, right? And the government data tend to, what looks like, generate much higher estimates of productivity than we get from household survey data. So even the public data we have, uh, are, it's hard to know sort of how to trust it. Okay. So we've done a lot of work then using these new satellite technologies to make measurements at a very local scale, at a field scale of smallholder agricultural productivity in many different settings. And I'm gonna show you results today for maize. Uh, we've, we've done this for other crops as well. Uh, David just showed you some nice examples in South Asia, working with folks in our group. Um, so here are four different settings uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa where we've used, again, these new satellite technologies to make measurements of yields, Kenya, uh, actually this is three examples from different years in Kenya, Uganda, we now have estimates in, in West Africa as well. And what you can see here is that satellites seem to do a decent job. The, the correlation between the satellite uh, predicted yield and the ground measured yield uh, is upward sloping. You don't have to squint too hard to see the upward sloping line. Uh, and the explained variation is typically between 20 to 50%, right? So there's clearly signal in the, in the satellite information. A question I think you would have here is, are these good enough? Are these measurements good enough to do anything? These are imperfect fits to the ground data that we uh, typically collect. The R squared here is not one, it's 0.2 or 0.5. Um, so to answer that question, you really need to understand where is the error coming from in these fits I just showed you? What, why are all the dots not on the one-to-one -one line? Is it because of errors in the satellite estimates, errors in the ground data, or errors in both, right? Um, and so this is a really important question when we think about using these uh, data for all sorts of things we care about. So we basically have two approaches for figuring this out that we've tried. One is to try to collect where we can gold standard measures of the outcome. So how do we typically measure, let's say, productivity on a field? Often we'll just ask the farmer, how much did you produce? How large was your field? And we generate the yield estimate by dividing one by the other, right? We know there's errors in that. They might misrecall how much they produce. They might not know the area of their particular plot very well, and those can introduce large errors into our ground data. Sometimes we'll do crop cuts on a small part of the field. And again, with large infield heterogeneity and productivity, that can introduce a lot of noise uh, in the field-specific measure of productivity. So instead, what we can do is try to collect a gold standard measure in here. Working with the LSMS team in Uganda, we were able to do this. We go out and do full plot harvest, where we harvest the entire plot with the farmer, uh, dry it uh, you know, to a consistent moisture level, and then uh, weigh it. And Simit folks know these techniques well. You guys do them all the time. Um, but they're few and far between, right? And so we, don't, we rarely have these sort of gold standard measurements in a well-geo-referenced environment that we can use them in this setting. But what we can do is when we have them, we can compare how well we do against our typical crop cuts or self-reports versus how well we do against these gold standard measurements. Uh, and that comparison gives us a sense of in a typical environment where a lot of the noise is coming from. And indeed, what we see is when we compare against these higher quality measures, the, the R squared is much higher. We explain up to 60% uh, of the variation. So that's one way to do this. The other way to do this, and David just gave a nice example, is we take our measurement from the satellite and we take our measurement from the ground and we use them to predict something we care about. So maybe uh, we've used them to predict a response to input, right? 
And we're going to look and see, okay, if they give roughly the same response, then we're going to think, okay, the satellites are actually doing a pretty good job at picking up the variation that we care about. And you can see that on the plot here. So this is a setting again in, um, this is from Uganda, where we have our crop cut yields or our typical ground measured yield and our satellite yields. And we're trying to use them to infer responses to fertilizer or infer responses to measured soil quality. And basically here, again, we find that they give us very similar uh, estimates, uh, which to us gives us a lot of confidence that the satellites are picking up meaningful variation uh, in the productivity that we care about. Okay, a couple more details, and this is in a review that we have coming out. Um, we tend to do better on larger fields, uh, and this is just something to know as we think about applying this technology. Uh, on very, very small fields, so a tenth of a hectare, uh, we do, uh, we tend to do worse, as you can see on this, uh, in this left plot here. Part of that is due to the difficulty in accurately georeferencing at that scale. And so small errors in georeferencing can mess you up when you're working with fields that are roughly the size of a pixel, I think, for, uh, for, for obvious reasons. Um, so, but this is important to keep in mind when we think about applying these technologies. So at, at uh, you know, field sizes of 0.2 or 0.3 hectares, we do substantially better, and that's going to cover you know, much or most of the smallholder fields, uh, even in the Sub-Saharan African context. Okay, finally, how much data do you need to actually train a satellite-based model? Uh, and here, using high quality ground data, basically what we find is you can get away with something like 50 to uh, 100 data points. So it's not like we need thousands and thousands of data points to train an accurate satellite model to predict yields. If we have 50, very good data points, we can train models that do quite well. So here's the relationship between uh, basically the error in your prediction and the number of training samples you get. And basically, as you get down to about 50 down here on this right plot, uh, we, we've maxed out performance. So, um, okay. And again, because we have imagery everywhere, we can scale these estimates. So here is work now we're doing at Atlas to take some of these uh, techniques and apply them across huge geographies and over time. So this is a picture of Western Kenya where we've been working. Um, and this is using Sentinel data so we can generate uh, subfield level estimates and productivity and update them uh, and basically generate these estimates before the crop is even out of the field. So this is near real time estimates of productivity validated at the field level and generated uh, at massive scale. Um, I'll go quickly uh, through this last part. Um, we can't, we're interested in things beyond just agricultural productivity. We've done a lot of work to show that satellites uh, and various sensors can be combined to measure other components of economic livelihoods. So we have studies here that have measured, and here's the citation down in the right at folks want. This is a study that just came out where we showed uh, we can do a pretty good job with satellites measuring uh, household level asset wealth across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and here we push the models really hard. We evaluate them on countries that the model has not seen. So we're evaluating them well out of sample. Uh, and these machine learning approaches uh, do a pretty good job of doing that. And again, these estimates, because we have imagery everywhere, uh, can be easily scaled. And this is something we're working on at, at Atlas. Um, okay, so some quick conclusions. Um, so again, this doesn't work yet for every crop, um, but for some crops uh, where we have some data to train, uh, in some geographies where we've been able to evaluate them, satellites can do a pretty dependable job of measuring productivity. We've shown that now in a lot of papers, others have as well. Uh, and these measurements can be, we think, as good or even better than the typical measurements we have of productivity on the ground. So to us, that's really promising in the sense of using these techniques for, for the scaling applications that we care about. Second, to train new models, uh, often just collecting a small number of very high quality data points can go a long way to training a model or validating a model in a new location. Again, a few dozen very high quality data points uh, is often all you need uh, to, to get a good sense of whether it's working. Um, and finally, we think satellites can move beyond just these agricultural applications to measure broader livelihood outcomes in a way that's, again, really useful for a lot of the impact assessment uh, that we want to do. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Very rich, um, uh, very rich presentations. Thank you so much. Um, so Marshall, you were saying um, uh, the satellites they can they can do better or, or not 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 worse than than measuring in the field. And you're saying also it's able to to come with these livelihood outcomes. How do you make sure that these kind of the access to this kind of technology and, and using this technology 
that this is uh, accessible to, to everyone who needs to have it? Or do you need to be a professor in digital agriculture to be using this? No, the, the hope is absolutely not. You don't need to uh, have an office at Stanford or at the CG to be able to use this. Um, the, uh, our, our hope at Atlas, and, and Atlas is set up as a, a public benefit corporation where we hope to make much of this data and, uh, and, and soon we'll be making most of the livelihood data I just showed you publicly available. So anyone can go in, download the data, um, use it for whatever purpose uh, they want. So uh, a big effort for us is, is in scaling this and making it available to folks doing good work on the ground. All right, thanks. David, to you, on, on um, what are the kind of investments needed to ensure that we're not widening the digital divide for the haves and the have-nots in, in this world? Yeah, I think uh, at the moment, the hype is further ahead than the evidence for digital tools. And I think there still needs to be a lot of concerted effort and money placed to do research, to understand what are the benefits you know, what are the drawbacks and in what context does does one solution work? What are the contexts that it doesn't work? And how does it work across the different geographies that we're working in? And this is a really big unknown right now. And I, I think as a community, we should focus on, on generating evidence um, and focus on generating a lot of evidence in a really short period of time. Marshall, would you agree with that? Are we at a point where it still requires a lot of, of research and understanding or you say, no, we're good to go and, and shoot to the moon? No, I, I think in a lot of domains, um, we, should, we should move a little bit cautiously and, and make sure the tools that we have are doing what we think uh, they're doing. Uh, I think in some narrow domains, so we've lurked, worked a lot on maize in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we're pretty convinced that, that what we can learn from satellites about productivity is about as good as what we would learn from our traditional measures. And so, you know, I think in some narrow domains, we're, we're ready to move forward and, and use this as a tool for impact assessment. Again, as we move to new environments, new cropping systems, new intercropping systems, we need to, we need to revalidate these models and that there's always going to be the importance of collecting high quality ground data, at least in, this, in the satellite setting, to make sure we're still doing a good job. Um, but again, this, this, in our experience, has replicated pretty well across settings. And, and so, I, you know, I, I think it's ready to go in that sense. That's very great. I would, let me jump in real quick. So I would agree with, with what Marshall said. And I think putting context uh, of my comment earlier was, was really at the, the farmer facing tools, right? The decision support systems, the smartphone apps, the SMS, you know, systems. I think that's the part where we're really lacking a lot more research. But yeah, for sure, like some of the satellite-based methodologies are, are pretty robust and, and are being used commercially in a lot of different applications. All right, great. Question to, to Daniel. Daniel, you're the leader of the community of um, practice. Where do you see this discussion on big data and agronomy go into the future? Uh, I mean, while I was listening to the to both presentations, I was just amazed, you know, how, because, you know, at, at least in the regions I work with, in the tropical regions, in mostly in Latin America, you've seen, uh, you've seen like extension agents uh, collecting, you know, like conducting surveys all over the place, all, all across the, 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 the continent. And, and, you know, to see that we can use uh, big data and remote sensing in order to collect some information that, you know, and like otherwise will take years to collect sometimes that is, is, is very expensive to 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 collect because it's mostly based on, on surveys i'm very happy to see it right now right like and i don't think the extension offices should be uh, conducting surveys all the time which is in many cases what is happening in in, in the region so yesterday in our in our first session uh, we brought the the the, um, what should be the skills that professionals working on, on extension uh, should have, right? And I saw this paper that came up this week on, on nature sustainability that, that states that extension services increase adoption rates. So I will add that they, that extension services play a key role not only helping to implement scaling in the field, right? Uh, that can be optimized with the tools that Marshall and David just uh, uh, showed. But also, I, I do think that the new generation of researchers empowered with this type of skills, in that they can go probably beyond the project's ex execution, and, and they are also kind of critical mass around how to scale efficiently and get done these uh, research for development initiatives. Great. Marshall, David, do you have a reaction to that, or what do you think? 
Marshall? No, that, that, that sounds great. Yeah. One thought is I, I do think, and this relates both to Daniel's point and David's point, um, th there has been a lot of hype about these technologies. So I, I do think, um, you know, it's, it's, I show these maps all the time. I get excited about them, but I, I do think, uh, you know, to both of their points, we, we do need to be clear headed about where they can work, what they can measure, uh, and where they can't work and, and, you know, not over promise in terms of the technology, but from the research perspective, uh, and, uh, from my perspective, I, I, I think as, as Daniel said, there's so much data being collected in the field or, or, or extension workers out there. I, I think if we're careful about the additional data that we collect and target that data collection really well, that's going to really amplify the power of these scaling techniques. So the better, data we can get on the ground. We don't need a ton of it. We just need very high quality data collected in a consistent way. Uh, that's just gonna push things forward really quickly. So I, to me, it's the it's the marriage of the two that's really gonna go a long way. Very nice. David, you have some, uh, I look at the time, some last words maybe. Yeah, I, I think it's just about understanding that we have different tools in our toolkit and understanding that each tool has its own you know, benefits and drawbacks, understanding where and when to use one tool. As Marshall was saying, you know, what do we need to do in order to collect data to enable a tool to work better and providing things in its context. Uh, you know, if we understand the context, I think we can better best choose which tool is most suited to, to which application. All right. Yeah, I really want to thank you because I'm not a big data person at all. I'm more a scaling person. But what I noted is that uh, Big data and scaling, they come together in, in really cutting costs. And I think, David, you showed that very, very nicely in your presentation. Um, recommendation areas, targeting where you should work, where you should focus on and, 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 and kind of concentrate the, the resources that you have. I also like that both of you are very realistic in the sense of saying it's not a magical, uh, a magical tool. It's really an instrument that you also need to learn to play, right? It's not like, okay, give somebody a trumpet and, it, and uh, the music uh, is good, no? So, great, thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time. Um, Daniel and Maria Camilla, thank you too. And thank you to the audience for, for your questions and your remarks that are flowing in. Thank you so much.